everyone. So the man himself has arrived, and if, uh, if we can have quiet in the room, we have 59 minutes and 42 seconds to make the most of our time with Andreas. Um, so uh, I've been requested to give uh, an introduction of you, but I'm going to skip that. I think you can see by the full room that people already know who you are and are looking forward to hearing your thoughts. I would like to share um, a couple of sound bites. Uh, you've been referred to by The Atlantic as the world's headmaster and by M Michael Gove as the most important man in English education. So I'm a little bit nervous. I'm excited to be interviewing you, but also I feel like I'm in the principal's office again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hopefully we'll have some fun. And I understand that there's going to be a lot of questions in the room. So I'm going to try to leave enough room at the end so we can hear from the audience as well. Um, and we want to know about your work today um, in this time together, but we also want to know about the man behind the work. So I'm going to ask a mix of questions um, about the work that you're doing and about you personally. So um, let's start with a little bit um, about your journey with the OECD and, um, and with PISA specifically. You've gotten a lot of global attention, obviously, um, of your work. What are you the most proud of? Well, first of all, to make you feel relaxed, I've never been a headmaster. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think to change the thinking of people about education, mm -hmm. we have always thought about you know, how many teachers do we employ, how much money we spend, but we yeah. actually spend very little time about what is it that we want to achieve, what are the yeah. values that are important to us, what, are, what does education really mean, and I think the one thing that PISA has brought out is this reorientation. Look, have a more careful look at how well do we educate children, how well do we educate all children, how many children fall through the cracks. All of that gets lost in often the very industrial view that we have on education. So I think that's I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of this that the global discussion has yeah. changed. I can give you an example for this. You know, when we started with PISA, I remember the day when I presented that idea to group of you know senior government officials from the OECD countries and they looked at this and they didn't actually get the idea. There were five countries that were saying well it's really interesting let's compare let's see ourselves through a common lens create a mirror in which we can see ourselves the rest of the country said you know either this cannot be done scientifically yeah. this shouldn't be done you know global comparison is not something we aspire to or this shouldn't be done by an organization like yours so yeah. That's been the perception, and that has fundamentally changed. And what do you think is the biggest shift in the thinking um, over the last 20 you know, plus years that, that you've been doing this work? What is, the, what is the big shift, and what do you think specifically the PISA and the other work that you've been doing um, has contributed to that shift? Yeah, you know, I think um, we used to think about education and frame the education discourse mainly around content. Yeah. And when we created the PISA test, we actually gave students most of the content. Yeah. And we built the test around the capacity to extrapolate from what they knew, use their knowledge creatively, apply their knowledge in novel situations. And that was not about, you know, in fact, I have the same view today. Some people say, well, you know, the only thing that we need to do is when students take a test, make sure they don't have their mobile phone and internet and nothing so that they will really work with their mind. I have no problems with people having access to the internet. You know, yeah. let's use everybody what to use whatever they have access to, but let's see to what extent they can think like a scientist, think like a mathematician, yeah. think like an historian. And that shift has really occurred. And I tell you this because when we constructed the PISA assessment at the beginning, there was a lot of resistance against that idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were very few countries, you know, in the Nordic sphere of Europe, Singapore, who had a similar kind of philosophy, but most of the countries did not, and they found that really strange. You give students half of the answers, what do you want to actually test? And I think that shift is now t is taken for granted. The world no longer rewards people just for what they know. Now, when Google knows everything, the yeah. world really rewards people what they can do with yeah. what they know. And I think that is arrived now through the work. It's interesting that you referred to resistance because I believe that there is still a lot of resistance and um, even criticism of what um, the PISA is doing around the world. What is one piece of criticism that you felt is really legitimate and valid and, and how have you applied that over the years to, to your work? You know, I think the biggest, I mean, a lot of criticism is about misunderstandings of the methodology and so on. I don't take that so serious, but I think the biggest point of criticism that I think we really need to think hard about is that Whatever you measure, 
puts a spotlight on what you measure. Yeah. And it risks that we lose sight of other things that are equally important. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, whether it's PISA or university entrance assessment, it's easy to measure things that we know how to measure. It's hard to measure things that are really important often. And yes. I think um, our response to this has been to actually gradually expand the scope. You can take two responses to this. Either say, well, I give up, you know, yeah. let's not compare. Or you can say, like, make, make our measures more relevant. Let's yeah. stop trading validity gains for efficiency gains in testing. Yeah. So for example, in 2012, we in, in, uh, assessed creative problem solving skills. And we were able to do that, actually. There was a completely new world that came out. Some students that were great in math were not great in creative problem solving. In 2015, you know, everybody is talking about social skills. Uh, this year, we're going to publish our first study on collaborative problem-solving skills. Mm -hmm. Not how well can you solve problems on your own, but actually, are you willing and capable to work with people who think differently from you, to share your experience, mm -hmm. to find joint solutions? So this is something that I fear is not just not part of PISA, but it's not part of education. We put people in individual roles behind their desks and ask them to do an individual test, an yeah. individual exam, and then we ask them to become great collaborators to solve yeah. the world's problems. Yeah. It just doesn't work. So yeah. PISA has responded to this, building this into. 2018, next year, we're going to assess global competence. How do you assess something like global competence or something like creativity? I saw that you facilitated a session on the arts here, mm -hmm. which I applaud that, um, that you are you know, really taking an interest in um, spaces like ar the arts or global citizenship or you know, um, creativity. Because uh, I run a network of schools myself, um, mm -hmm. I see the kind of importance that plays in, in the lives of our kids. But how do you, one of the things we've struggled with is just the challenge in really measuring and the limitations in measuring some of this. So what is some of the work that you're doing on that front? Yeah, you know, I actually find the hardest challenge, not the measured one, the, but the conceptualizing these mm -hmm. issues. No? Mm -hmm. What is emotional well-being? What is yeah. resilience? What is courage? What is leadership? What's yeah. curiosity? We all know they are terribly important. We have a kind of feeling what they are. Yeah. But actually, once you can actually conceptualize those things, you find ways to measure this. It's mm -hmm. not so difficult, actually. The one advantage that we have in PISA over any other national effort is that we have the world's best expertise. You know, we can draw on talent from anywhere around the world, get the best people working on those problems. We, we do find answers to this. Mm -hmm. But to find the common ground, to really think about, you know, creativity has so many dimensions. It's about, you know, you can have, be very creative in mathematics. Mm -hmm. People don't associate those two things, but creativity can be, you know, thinking about solution spaces, finding new answers to, to old problems. Uh, creativity can be about the arts, mm -hmm. can be about music, can be about uh, sports, you know, athletics. Mm -hmm. And um, once we have a really good concept of that, but mm -hmm. I actually take this further. If we do not build a good conceptual understanding, we will never see those things in instruction. They will always be the realm of a few great teachers who are able to do those things, yes. but they will never become part of educational practice. So I think yeah. we should collectively spend more time on conceptualizing them, building them into the design of curricula, yeah. building them into le innovative learning environments, and then the measurement challenge, I don't see a big problem with. So I think you've highlighted a really important issue. So even in our schools, you know, we have now too much data, right? We're assessing the kids constantly, you know, we, we're, but we're not using it in a meaningful way. We're not using it for learning. We're just using it at, as an assessment of learning which you know, I some way argue that that is how PISA is being used um, even today. So what are you doing on that front? How are you ensuring that people are taking this data and applying it into exactly the areas that you're describing, into pedagogy, into content, into teacher development? Yeah, you know, on one end, um, it's already happening. You know, I, I, I can give you again the example of the origins of PISA. You know, why did I start with PISA? Because I, because I had 35 ministers of education in a room each of one was telling me, you know, I have the world's best education system. And if I have a little problem left, you know, last year I put a reform in place to solve that problem. Were they Indian? <laughs> yeah. But there was the discourse. There was no awareness of other systems. You know, they all thought the system was great because this was the only one they really knew. Yeah. And I think that's what we've changed. Today, you know, when they meet, they think about, oh, in Finland, how did you do this? And how in the Netherlands did you create successful voucher schools? And how in Hong Kong? In China, did you create creative classroom settings? So I think that has happened. In a way, the learning at the system level in PISA yeah. is really working well. 
but we, you are asking a more challenging question, and that is really how we can integrate the worlds of learning and the worlds of assessment. Yes. We take them as two separate worlds. Yeah. You know, we think assessment takes time away from learning rather yeah. than adding value to learning. Yeah. And uh, I think there are two answers to this. One is technology. Mm -hmm. I think modern technology enabled learning allows us to give instant feedback to students and integrate and make learning adaptive, mm -hmm. make learning personalized. And, uh, mm -hmm. We, we see that even in the latest PISA round, you know, people always look to the scores. How well do people come yes. out of math and science? The most interesting data set is a different one. The most interesting data set is we are now capturing every mouse click of the students. So we can actually see how students get towards the solutions. We yes. can see, you know, does it vary across schools, across classrooms? This tells us a lot about implemented curriculum. Right? Yeah. We know a lot about the intended curriculum, what we yeah. want to teach, what people, what teachers think they're teaching. We can see something about what actually happens in students' minds through assessment. I think harnessing that kind of data is opening up the world and giving students this instant feedback, giving teachers, helping students learn better, helping teachers teach better, helping systems be more effective. The, the problem is that often you know, we have a very instrumental use of assessment, but we don't even look for mm -hmm. those answers. Yeah. If we want to look for them, we'll find them. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about technology um, in education? I think many people here are teachers or, or principals or you know, are leading um, school systems themselves. So, and I think technology is a, a space that is still very undiscovered in terms yeah. of its potential in the, in the space of education. So where have you seen the best applications of technology? What are some of the most promising ideas? You know, we studied that over 65 countries. And the honest answer is that today, technology does probably more damage than good to yeah. learning. It has ma made learning more shallow than deep. It in has what way would you say that it's made it more shallow? You can see that in the student responses. You know, uh, we have these kind of mile-wide, inch-deep instructional systems where you do everything a little yeah. bit. And the kind of deep conceptual understanding that is really understanding the foundations of your discipline, that's not something that happens through technology. So I think today there's a lot of hard work that we need to do to get mm -hmm. to a better point. But there are great schools doing this, and there are some systems doing that well. You look to Australia, long experience in this. You look to Singapore, future schools. But they are isolated, and this is not yet. And, and the issue is really, you know, we have 21st century technologies and one-way 21st century learners. We have 20th century pedagogy and a 19th century kind of institutional structure, you know, the very industrial schooling structures that actually inhibit the use of technologies to liberate us from kind of past practice and do things in new ways. So we do th old things with new technologies and that makes things actually worse than, than better. You know, if students sit in the classroom and they copy and paste text from Google, surely you get worse outcomes than they were taught in very traditional ways. The, the other part is that um, we tend to forget that learning is a social process mm -hmm. and a deeply relational process. Mm -hmm. We had a very interesting experiment, you know, with the National Science Foundation. There were five-year-old children in the United States exposed to a Chinese teacher. And within six months, they picked up the language. They started to speak, you know, words of Chinese and so on. They filmed that teacher, 3D cameras, highest technology. And they did the same thing with another group of children, same hours, same teacher, on a television screen. And the children watched the television but the learning, ga learning gains were zero. So I think we need to better understand where actually can, te where, where can technology amplify that relationship yeah. and extend that relationship? You know, where can teachers' role change through technology? Building actually strengths, I mean, a great coach is always better than a bad teacher. Yes. And how can we actually shift the role of teachers so that it amplifies? But I think the idea that we can replace teaching with technology is just one that is done, doing more damage than good. I totally agree. But I think one of the challenges, especially I, I run a small network of schools in India, uh, one of the challenges in developing countries is the, the dearth of talent that, that is available, the dearth of talent to be teachers, to be principals. Um, and so when we talk about this evolving role of a, of a teacher, we're talking about, in fact, a more complex role, a teacher as a facilitator, mm -hmm. a teacher who is able to draw on learning, who is able to connect complex ideas, integrate subjects. And so when you look at the very real challenges that you know, some of these school systems around the world, in fact, are facing when it comes to, to the talent that they're drawing from, how do you, 
you know, rectify the two because technology is there. It's only going to become a bigger, play a bigger role. And I think one of the pieces of resistance to it is that, you know, it's often being used as a tool to replace a teacher, mm -hmm. like you're pointing out. To, uh, so, so how do you see these two kind of, um, you know, tensions interplaying and what, what are some solutions that you see to that? Yeah, you know, I think teacher supply is a real <coughs> issue. But we need to ask ourselves what's cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's actually just about making teaching more financially attractive. Yeah. The hardest challenge is to make teaching intellectually attractive, to yeah. actually give teachers the room to become designers of instructional practice, to own their professional practice, to work with their fellow teachers on new solutions, to work actually be, if you do not involve teachers in the design of policies and practices, they are not going to help you with implementation. That's a very simple kind of yes. sort of building that kind of framework where we use, where we make the work of people more interesting. Mm -hmm. i give you an example. If you are a teacher in um, Shanghai in China, you teach 11 to 16 hours per week. If you're a teacher in the United States, you teach 23, 24, 28 hours, depending on what you teach. So the teacher in the United States sits in the classroom, cannot do anything else but teaching and becomes a kind of wheel in this repeating of material. Why is it like this? Because they wanted to have small classes. They didn't increase the number of teachers, so they end up with this kind of work profile. The teacher in, in Shanghai teaches 45 kids, 50 mm -hmm. kids in the classroom, and that frees up so much time. You know, the once per week they observe somebody else's classroom. Once per month they go to a teacher kind of exhibition competition demonstration lesson. Every day they prepare the lessons together with other teachers. They do experimentation, they do research, they do, they are embedded in a profession. They are part of a profession. They see themselves as contributing to the profession. You know, they have a digital platform where teachers can upload and share their lesson plans. And they link that to reputational metrics, like what we do on eBay or Amazon. And actually, the more other teachers are going to download your lessons, use your lessons, improve your lessons, the more status you obtain in the profession. So this is a completely different notion. Yeah. And I think this is what, if we want to get great people into teaching, we have to make the job interesting. Most people go into teaching, you know, if you want to become rich, go to Goldman Sachs, not become a teacher. <laughs> it, but the reason why teachers are in schools is because they want to make a difference. They want to work with people. So it gives them more space to work with people, yeah. to do what they are best at. And I think you will have great people entering yeah. the profession. Finland is the best example on this. Mm -hmm. Finland gets nine applications for every teaching post, despite average pay. It's the second most prestigious job in the country. If you fail to become a teacher, you can still become a lawyer or an economist. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, the economists, I, I won't make rude comments about economists. <laughs> Sorry, let's move on. <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the criticisms I've heard of, of this exact argument is that, OK, that's really nice to think about teachers playing this role, and it's intellectual, and it's inspiring, and it's challenging. You know, but look at the reality of these countries today and look at where they are and how do you actually move these systems forward towards this vision that, mm. that you're describing. Um, and do you have real examples that you can point to um, from, from these years of work where you've seen it happen? Certainly, and what did I mean, they do? Certainly China is just absolutely amazing. You know, if you think where they were, where they are now, where they are going. You know, I had recently, I was in the province of Chongqing in China. Uh, province in the western part, and to be very honest with you, I didn't even know that name, that city, before I came there, and I found out Neither that there are 30 I. million people living there. <laughs> so, and, um, but what was so interesting, I speak with the governor, and he was so interested in our work on values in education, on mm -hmm. character qualities, and how we, and I ask, you know, that's so interesting that you sort of are so keen on walking on this. What drives this? Because, I mean, I imagine, you know, if lots of people who can't read and write, and he yeah. was telling me, you know, in my province, I produce 40% of the world's supply in mobile phones and, and, and laptops. All the technology comes from here. 10, 15 years from now, each and every of those jobs is gone. Yeah. The kind of routine cognitive skills that we produce here are giving us another 10 years. 
I need to think beyond, I need to think ahead of it. And I think an amazing kind of framework, Vietnam, and most East Asian systems actually have got that notion that education is not, you know, educa educating people for our past, but educating people for their, creating their own future. They very much have this idea that the future is more important than the present. That's why people work hard. That's why people invest in education. That's why they make this. I think there's enormous progress. If you go to Europe, I think Finland is impressive in the sense in the 1970s it was an average performer in a big economic crisis and it's become one of the world's education leaders. Mm -hmm. You can look at the Netherlands, Flanders, they're great examples. Look at Colombia, the progress that a country like a war-torn country, you know, you, mm -hmm. I mean 10 years ago and I visited Colombia actually uh, 15 years ago when I visited Colombia first. This was a horrible place to be. Today, you know, they are building this kind of, they're building their system from the ground. Uh, creating schools where there was never anything like this. Yeah. And I think there is a level of progress. And uh, most of those systems that see progress have a notion of a teacher as a change maker, yeah. as opposed to a teacher and a big kind of industry. So let's talk about the places where they don't see it like that. Um, and you know, maybe some of us live in those countries. Um, some of us have children um, who go to school in those countries or who teach in those countries. Um, when there isn't that will and that openness, um, to, to really stand up and to, to drive that kind of change. Where do we begin? What can we do? What can you do? What can we do um, as, all, as we are all participants in those systems? That's always the hardest question. I think if you do not have the kind of leadership at the top, if there is no value in society placed on education, it's very hard to change this. Actually, I mean, yeah. the UAE here is a good example, you know. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of effort being put into the education system, but it's more or less like pushing a rope, really, because, you know, children grow up with very wealthy kind of environments, and why should they spend their lives studying hard? That is difficult to change, but I think it's a the first responsibility is really for leaders to convince their citizens yeah. that investing in the future is important. In a way, you know, every Chinese parent invests their last money in the education of their children, Europe and even the United States, we have already spent the money of our children for our consumption today. <laughs> that's why we are so badly adapted. Uh, I mean, that's, that, that, that illustrates the point. You know, yeah. I think that's the first thing. I think without leadership, it's very hard to change it. Once you have that, there's a lot of things you could do on the ground. You know, yeah. The first thing, I actually like the Global Teacher Prize here because this is basically, it's a very simple thing to do. Yeah. But actually what you're saying, well, these are not the factory workers. There are amazing people here who do their work. And the, the, the 100 or 50 that are here are just the tip of the iceberg. There are you know, millions of people like this walking around the world. That's the first thing, changing our mind set that teachers are not part of an industry, but yeah. they are knowledge workers and they will change uh, the minds of people. I think that's building capacity at the ground level. You need good incubators for ideas. Most of our systems are so standardized, so compliance driven, so homogeneous, that it's very hard to do things differently. Yeah. In our TALIS survey, I once asked teachers, you know, do you think innovation in your classroom is going to help or hinder your career? And only 23% said, well, you know, if I do things differently, that's a really great thing, and I'm going to be benefiting from this. The majority of teachers consider the school an innovation hostile environment. So changing the work organization, creating more diversity in teacher careers, giving people possibilities to grow, that is something that we can do in any yeah. system. But then we need good incubators. We need really pioneering schools who have the discretion to do things differently, to yeah. create different learning environments and test them. So can you walk me through what happens? So the, the PISA assessment gets administered, the results come in, you release them to the press. What happens in you know, a week in the life of, of you after the, the assessment results are released? Actually, to be frank, the week before, the release is much more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Friendly. let's backtrack a week. What happens? Yeah. No, actually, the, <laughs> in the weeks before, we do our best to explain the results to countries and to work out responses to them. Because once the results are out, it's too late. You know, you run. If you do not know, you know, what you're going to do with this. And that's why I often feel, you know, just it's like with reforms where policymakers <laughs> announce reforms through the media, the reform is dead from the start. If you do not involve people yeah. in the design, communicate, bring people along, nothing going to happen in implementation. Same as with PESA. 
if we don't do our job properly in getting sort of a good understanding for what needs to be done, what can be done, we cannot use the momentum that is created with the results to impact on change. And that's what I see in countries that are open to that, that are willing to this, that are open to the world, that are open to other ideas, you can see enormous change. In countries that have a hard time facing the truth, facing a comparison, that are sort of look, taking an inside look, the results are not often having a very productive impact. But that's sort of what I spent my time with in the mm -hmm. weeks before, you know, yeah. working with senior policymakers, and afterwards it's a bit of communication, but that's sort of not so much our priority then. So what is, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about your journey as a leader as well. So I would imagine that this is a highly complex environment for you to navigate, right? There's multiple stakeholders, you're working across countries. A lot of the, the criticism is that, you know, the PISA is trying to, you know, take broad strokes across massive cultural differences, mm -hmm. sociological differences, right? Mm -hmm. And how relevant is that? So you're, you're operating in this environment. What are the qualities that you had or that you've developed that have really helped you navigate some of those most challenging situations? Yeah, I think you have to believe in the idea that education can change. And that's sometimes very, very hard because yeah. the trajectories of change are so long. And I think if you lose that confidence, you'll just, you know, and it's almost, you know, the one thing I learned is that in this kind of work, you have to, and it's actually what my, my boss, when I had this idea of PISA, taught me, you know, you have to walk like a submarine. You have to go very deep, <laughs> go very fast, and then come up. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you go on the surface, it's very tiring. You know, there are all sorts of kinds of arguments being made. I mean, the, the status quo has so many protectors you know, from all sides. And actually, this is the moment you advocate for change. They come all out of their holes. You know, that's really, I think, something that you're going to see that this yeah. is very, very hard. And, um, yeah. I found that the biggest kind of, you have to have a long-term perspective where you want to be and what you want to change and what you have to have a view of what education should be. You need to be uh, very adaptive because the policy environments change in breathtaking space. You know, we work, the electoral cycles are sh so short yeah. with regard to the educational cycles. Of now change. there's no cycle, right? There's just a tweet. Yeah. So. yeah. So what do you do in that changing political environment also, where, yeah, yeah, where there to, isn't as much patience? You have to be very adaptive. And also what I really learned early on is that um, you have to be grounded in reality. And one of the things that I, I mean, I have to do a lot of traveling, there are a lot of things I need to do, but the, the greatest privilege I have, I've, I've been in classrooms of over 60 countries. So wow. I can associate the data and the results with what actually happens on the ground. And I can use a lot of examples and experiences from around the world to convince people of the need for change and the possibility to change. I mean, that's the important thing is that we can yeah. see always, you know, there's an option space of improvement. I think that capacity to see those possibilities, to communicate them is very important. You need to relate to, to, to very different ways of thinking, very different philosophies yeah. about education. I encounter that every day. I find that actually interesting. I learn every day, you know, in my job, you know, I meet amazing people, teachers, school leaders, system leaders, policy makers. And um, that diversity in thinking over long periods of time, mm -hmm. I think, is, is very important. Resilience, you know, you, yeah. you need to be, the, the amount of criticism that you get yeah. is just incredible. And you have to see through this you, in two ways. You know, you, if you get bogged down with it, you get nothing done. You yeah. need to find about what are the three elements that I really want to work on. These people have a great, great point. We need to be better at this, and then focus your energy on this. And at the same time, you know, make sure that the rest of the criticism doesn't sort of yeah. have too much of an impact. So you talked a little bit about learning and the importance of learning and that growth mindset, and that's a recurring theme. Mm. Um, you know, whether it's about the the political leadership and their openness to learning, or a teacher's mm. openness to learning, or children's openness to learning. How do you cultivate that in yourself? What are some of the books that have helped you learn or some of the people or experiences that have helped you learn? And how do you cultivate that mindset in others? I for myself, you know, I'm very fortunate really in the sense that I learn every day. In every conversation and every experience that I have, I can see, you know, new opportunities, new things. So I, I sort of I'm exposed to new ideas. You know, yeah. if I had a job from nine to five every day in the same place, same thing to do. I would have had a much harder kind of time. So I, I think that comes natural, mm -hmm. that, that, that possibility for, mm -hmm. for, for me to learn, to be open to new ideas, to be open to change, to be aware, to have an outside perspective. You know, what does society actually look for in education? We often take a very inward looking. Right? I think that sort of the, the 
space for learning in my field is I have the most privileged job in that sense, yeah. you know, working in education and in a field that is rapidly kind of evolving. How do we cultivate this in others? I think the most important thing is to give people hope and the perspective that change is possible, show good examples, and that's often hard in education because yeah. we have, by tradition, you know, selection goes always over improvement. You know, we are very good in ranking human talent. We are not very good in developing human talent. The school systems are built around the concept of selection. We do the same with teachers. We do the same with leaders. We have a accountability. You know, when I say that word, immediately the association is there's some punitive instrument. You know, someone's going to come to look over my shoulder when mm -hmm. I. But that is not in the sense. You know, I'm. You know, in the sense of professional accountability. So changing that, building those kinds of perspectives and showing good examples, I think that's what I really try to do and um, use our, our data and evidence for. So I think one of the, the values of uh, having these kinds of sessions is for us to really talk about failure because we see you, um, we're so you know, inspired by the work that you do and, and all that you've learned, but I think it's really important to also you know, openly talk about times that we've failed and what we've learned mm. from them and celebrate them, in fact, as, as opportunities for learning. So what's, can you share an example of, of a time that, that you feel you failed, and, and what did you learn from that? And you know, what, what lessons can we also draw from that? Yeah, you know, I think there are big issues that I really worry about. You know, if I think about how fast learning and education progresses, and PISA progresses, and how rapidly the world changes, I worry the big gap is becoming bigger, not smaller. And that's something I, I'm not sure we are, and in my work as well, that we are succeeding to actually embrace. In a way, you know, technology works exponentially, and humans are hardwired for many things. You know, we talk about empathy, social skills, all of those things, and at the end of the day, you know, our human brain is ma ma done for the opposite often. And so I think this is something that I, I really worry about. This is the, the, where I think the biggest risk of, of failure lies, and I, that's what keeps me awake you know, at night. You know. Is the world changing too fast? Are we able to catch up? So I think that's one thing. And then there are many small things. You know, in my work, um, uh, I had to concede defeat many times. You know, I couldn't get things done. I give you a good example. You know, I, um, wanted to do this assessment of global competency in 2018. I think this is what the world needs most, if anything, today. The open-mindedness, the willingness of people to work with people who are different from them and so on. From 100 countries, I got eight countries that were open to this from a start. Most of the world community says it's a nice to have, but you know, it's not really yeah. central. So what do I do with this? Well, you know, I try to sort of put a gear down, build a broader alliance of people, try to change the way of thinking, try to engage with different stakeholders, and then when the time is right, come up with this again. And I did, and we are now on a much better ground. But I think the most important thing is uh, you, you need to, when, when I failed with things, I asked myself a very hard question. Did I try to do the right thing? When I conclude, actually, you know, those people who said, no, we're probably right, I changed my mind. When I come to the conclusion, really, this is the right thing, and I try to actually approach things differently. You know, trying to do the same thing again leads me to a bigger failure. Mm -hmm. But trying to do things differently sometimes does work. And in most cases, I must say, I, I, I've been successful to address mm -hmm. the challenges in the long term. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, you can always do things better. You can always do things faster. But yeah. at the end of the day, I think it's possible. You talked a little bit about this um, you know, assessment that you're planning for 2018 around global mm. citizenship, I, I believe. Uh, yesterday, there was a debate here about the tension between national values and, and these, these values of yeah. global citizenship. And we see that unfolding before our eyes, where you know, nationalism and populism is rising. So where do you see the role of this assessment in that kind of wider political con context? You know, I don't see actually, I, I don't like sort of the concept of international versus national values. Mm -hmm. I, for me, global competencies has as much to do with how we relate here or how we relate in this room than it has to do how you know, countries relate with each other or mm -hmm. people. It's not just about working across national boundaries. It's mm -hmm. really about understanding that people think differently, feel differently, and mm -hmm. being able to sort of a concept of empathy on a macro level. Mm -hmm. The issue of binding social capital. How do we build trust? How would we extend our radius of trust to strangers, to institutions? That, I think, for me, is the essence of that concept. 
And I do think that is something that we need to become better. Why do I say this? Because societies that don't build floors under people, in that sense, will have people reaching out for walls. You know, why do people, you know, why we see this growing fragmentation in the world? It's simply because we left too many people behind. We have dealt with inequality through redistribution. You are poor, okay, here you have some money, be happy. And that approach has worked for some time, as long as that was the driver. It hasn't worked on the social front. The risk of social exclusion is now so high that you have people saying, well, I want to go back to the past, where I was safe, where I didn't have to engage in change. You cannot expect people to accept that their job will disappear or taken over by a robot mm -hmm. if they don't feel prepared for the next one or to create the next one. And I think this is, the, this is the concept behind. And this is why I believe really that global competency, what we're trying to assess, mm -hmm. is the response to a digital interconnected world. Now, the digital world brings the world to you and now you have to deal with it. Now you have to thrive on it, build on diversity. So I, I really think that is very, very important You've, you've referred to jobs many times about, you know, our children may have many different careers in the future. Mm. Um, they may have jobs that we can't imagine even existing in the future. What do you think is the, the most important thing that we can do um, in our classrooms today to prepare our kids for that kind of world? What, what does a teacher go back and do and change? Yeah, you know, this is a difficult question. I think the most important thing is that we can do is not to think of tomorrow's jobs. You know, yesterday I was in a discussion here where people thought about, you know, we to should teach every three-year-old coding. <laughs> and then I asked myself, well, you know, by the time those people are going to graduate, they will say, coding, what was that? You know, where did I ever <laughs> need it? Our societies have advanced. Yeah. And I think that is a danger. We have a very instrumental view on education. You know, education is to get a job, and that job may no longer exist. I do think that... For, when you take science, for example, we pu push you know, biology, chemistry, physics on people. We spend far too little time on the capacity to design an experiment, to think like a scientist, to actually have, you know, see science as something that opens life opportunities. So get interested in this. And I think if you don't do a better job, I, th I think you know, we, we should get in a classroom, and that's back to your question, teach fewer things at greater depths. Get, get, get people to the root of the, the scientific disciplines or the, or the artistic disciplines. Focus on subjects that will foster their talent mm -hmm. and find out, you know, help people, students. If you succeed as a teacher to help a child find out, you know, what are their passions? Mm -hmm. What can they become really, really good at? What is going to serve a social purpose? You've done a much better job than preparing them for what you think is going to be the next job. Yeah. <clears throat> So one of the things you hear people say in response um, to this kind of vision is that, well, I would love to do all of those things in my classroom, but I'm preparing them for a standardized test that's next week. They need to do well on the PISA. Um, you know, how am I supposed to do all of these things? So I would love to, you know, discover my kid's passion, and I would love to do a few things and go deep, but I just, my system is not allowing me, does not empower me to do so. Um, what do you think about that argument? Do you think that's legitimate? Um, and if you think it is legitimate, then how do we help systems move you know, out of that space? Well, you know, I think we're all good to prioritize the urgent over the important. You know? That's what we, I, actually one statistic that I show people typically on this is, it's a chart where I plot the amount of learning time in school against performance on PISA. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised, the relationship is negative. In fact, you know, just doing more of the same mm -hmm. is not leading to better learning outcomes. I think this is the secret of countries like Finland. Mm -hmm. They teach have one of the shortest school days. They send children to school with seven, before seven. It's all about social and emotional development. And they have great learning outcomes at age 15. Mm -hmm. To have the courage as a teacher. I understand all of the constraints that teachers are under. Mm -hmm. But to have the courage to really, you know, focus on rigor, mm -hmm. cognitive demand, to teach a few things at great depths and to believe that sometimes less is a lot more. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the secret to good education. But I do understand, you know, the, the, the incentive structures are all geared against them. Yeah. That's Where do you see your role kind of beginning and ending, right? So, I mean, I, I'm asking you a lot of questions that are very expansive in their expectation of, you know, thinking about how to actually solve some of those problems. So if you were to kind of define where you see your role at OECD in terms of what's possible for you to do and what's not possible for you to do, 
you know, how would you describe that? Yeah, you know, I've always followed a really simple philosophy. I always tell people, you know, I can't tell you what you need to do because I'm not you and I'm in your context. Yeah. But I can tell you what everybody else has been doing and with what effect. So what I can do is mobilize ideas, share ideas, give people, you know, f solutions that work elsewhere in the world. And then, you know, they need to think about how they can configure that and do that in their own context. But that's where I see the boundary. It would be wrong, you know, for anyone at an international level to tell a teacher in the classroom or a policymaker in a country, you know, that's your solution because they always know better. I think that's a very, for me, a very sharp boundary that, yeah. you know, you can be a knowledge broker, a knowledge mobilizer, but ultimately it's the people on the ground who have to have the, you know, one of the things, it, when I started with my war, everybody was telling me, you will never get, you'll never be able to do this because you have no financial powers, you know, we're not like the World Bank giving money away, you have no legislative powers, you're not like the European Union who can make laws for European countries or the UN who can pass sanctions. You have no legislative and no financial powers. I actually think this is my biggest strength. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, this is about ideas. You know, some people take them, some people don't. That's also the frustration. You know, sometimes yeah. you see actually, you know, this is a country that would need to do something real and nothing is happening. But that's, you have to be willing to accept that. Yeah. One of um, my personal frustrations was that after um, the 2009 PISA assessment, um, India chose to withdraw yeah. from, from taking yeah. the PISA. Um, and I was really disappointed that um, our country chose to do that. But now they've decided to participate yeah. again um, in 2021. Um, w do you play a role in that journey in helping them shift you know, their openness to, and, and if so, what was it? What was it? It's actually a great example where I, you know, I, I think um, it's uh, surely, I mean, I don't think the decisions by the Indian government were good, but I also think it's a good example where I, I attribute part of it to my failure. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a good example where we work with the two states in India, build an assessment, run the test, and then give them the results. I did not invest the time that would have been necessary to help people understand those results, help them. You know, the, the answer there was basically, Oh, we can't be that bad, so the, the test, there must be something wrong with the test. The answer actually is there's a very shallow pyramid. You know, there are some amazing schools, but there are also lots of schools with very poor quality. And so the average comes, had I done a better job, spend more time to help people understand this. Maybe they would have said, okay, the results are poor, we know why, we're going to improve them. The response was, let's forget about this thing. So what I did afterwards is actually I engaged with the government in different ways. You know, we actually used to work with their test developer because the first response was there must have been something flawed with the assessment. Then we worked with them, we got their people, their experts working with this, and suddenly they said, oh, this is an amazing test, this is really great. So, so we built the kind of understanding and support and now they're back. But it's a good example where you know, I was frustrated at the beginning, but then I thought hard, I said, well, I could have done better, yeah. and I tried. I'm going to ask you a couple of just fun questions. Um, if you weren't doing this job, what job would you want to have? I actually, I had a completely different job before. You uh -huh. know, I worked, uh, my background is physics. I had actually not studied education. I got interested in education through my military service. Actually, I, in, in my, my country, in Germany, when you refuse to do military service, you have to work, do social work. And they sent me to a school with disadvantaged children. And, um, I really got interested in this. But had that not happened, and then my whole career went around education, had that not happened, I would probably have stayed in the field of science. I like this, I like to understand the world, yeah. to, to change the world. And that's actually something that has stayed with me. You know, as a scientist, what you learn is actually that knowledge is infinite, that you can always find new ways of thinking, that you can always, and I try to work on that. Well, we're lucky to have you. I'm, <laughs> glad, I'm glad you had that experience. Um, and when you want to let your hair down and just have some fun, what do you do? Actually, I have very little time other than for that, you know. <laughs> you don't do that? That's a very German yeah. answer. Yeah. I can tell you, at 4 o'clock, a car is going to take me to Abu Dhabi. I'm meeting the minister there. At 9 o'clock, I'm leaving for China. And tomorrow morning, I am in China. So. I was going to say we can make you dance a little bit tonight at the party. Yeah, you will see. Um, don't so, try that. <laughs> so I'm going to open up the, the floor for questions. How would you like to do this? Would you like to take a few questions, yes. listen to a few yeah. first? Of yeah. Of course, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have I think some if paper you can, uh, This man in the gray suit. 
There's lots of questions. Yeah, yes, you can take this. Thank you. On? Okay. It's always enlightening to to hear to hear you talking. Now we all know what we what the challenges we we're facing in the education, in the traditional education. We all know we need to inject the emotional and social and positive intelligence. And I don't see much being done. Let's say you're in the decision maker ma makers and you want to make a decision and prioritize what need to be done. Where do you start? Okay, so a question around mm -hmm. priorities. Thank you. Um, I've really thoroughly enjoyed listening to you at various uh, activities over the last two days. Um, my, I'm from South Africa. I focus on early education, uh, so preschool education, which hasn't featured much here. But one of the things that's come through so often is the importance of building skills for sort of 21st century skills, creativity, problem solving, curiosity, entrepreneurship. And those things are fundamentally wired in a child's brain before they enter our formal education system. That's the kind of experiences in early childhood build brains that are flexible in those ways. Um, and what we have in early childhood as well is we don't have the kind of systems that we have in education that you refer to. It's very difficult to change an existing system. So I think that there are enormous opportunities within early education. We don't have restrictive systems and we have enormous uh, evidence and science around the benefits of investment. So my question is, are we doing enough to take advantage of that opportunity? Uh, I, have um, a I just want to get to the, yeah, please go ahead I, and then I want to turn around and get to the back of the room also. Yeah. I'm Victoria Sorraquin from Argentina. Here. Although you spoke about creativity and I understand what you think, aren't you afraid that if all the countries start preparing their students for PISA, we will miss that creativity because all countries are going to be doing the same? And the second question is, who is correcting the PISA open questions? How do you do to have people correcting all, all those open questions and having the same criteria? Mm -hmm. I start with the last one. It's actually the easiest one. It sounds hard. You know, most of the PISA tasks are not the kind of multiple choice questions, but ones where you, students have to create their own tests, to write their answers. And you think it's very difficult to score that. Actually, we've become pretty good at that. We have also done extensive, basically, it's done by four independent writers in a country. And then we swap booklets. You know, we give booklets from Argentina to Brazil, or you know, from, and so we actually have a very good mechanisms to get pretty reliable outcomes. But I should also say, I always prioritize validity over reliability. So even if the writers don't agree exactly, it's enough because I don't give the student an individual score. I don't give a school an individual score. I just look at the results overall. And I'm happy if this is sort of fair enough. I'm much happier than just saying I go to the common denominator of testing multiple choice knowledge that I know is right or wrong. So I, th I think that is an easy, easy answer. The question on priorities is really hard. You know, and some of the things are very unpopular. For example, what I learned from high performing education systems, whenever they have to choose between a better teacher and a smaller class, they go for the better teacher. They give their teachers every tool to do their work well. They give them every support, and then they end up often with the larger classes. That is not the choice that is very popular in the system. So I think priorities in spending resources is, is, is a big issue. When it comes to content, it's much harder. You know, what happens in education is actually very sad. You know, you have every year something new. These days, it's about you know, digital literacy. You know? Tomorrow, it's about environmental literacy. The day after, it's about financial literacy. So we, our curricula are becoming shallower and shallower and wider and wider. The only way to walk against this is when you have countries like Singapore, where they actually frame the entire education system around a few core values. Tolerance, harmony, resilience, curiosity. And everything that you propose to be included in the Singaporean curriculum, you know, if this, you have this great idea, you know, we have a financial crisis, we should have a lot of financial education, they'll ask you, how is that going to contribute to those core values? If we do not have an intellectual core of what education is about, we will, this, we will have a negotiated education system as opposed to designed education system. And priority setting becomes a very, very difficult business. And if priorities become, you know, a consensus, you are really sort of putting your children up not to be prepared for tomorrow's world, but for 
the lowest common denominator of today's world. Very, very difficult thing, but through our data, we can actually help countries with this. We can tell them actually those are the kind of choices that are made in, in different places. Question on early learning, there's absolutely not done enough around that. I don't even, you know, on the one hand, I think the fact that we have not formalized that sector is a big strength of the sector. But it's also its biggest weakness, it's because it's very patchy. You know, if you have people who really care about children, they do a fantastic job. If you have people who are not experienced, who do not even, in a way, um, what happens in early childhood <coughs> education, sometimes we do more damage than good in something that is well meant. You know, the country where I go, in France, you know, children are put to early childhood education when they are three years old. You know, they sit behind individual rows, you learn something, the teachers think I'm doing a great job. You know, that's what they were taught, or teach them mathematics and reading. By age 15, we see poor PISA results. That's not the answer. You know, had they spent more time playing, had they, so I think having really highly qualified people in that place and a systematic basis is very, very important. We put much, I mean, you can see that in pay scales. Why do we pay a, pay a secondary teacher two, three times as much as an early childhood education uh, person? There's no logic in this. No. Actually, the job is so much more difficult for children than it is in, in, in high school. I think there are many things that we can do better to actually prioritize early learning in much better ways. The social and emotional qualities that we all talk about, that's where you build them. They're much harder to build when we're grown up, when we have a mindset. So I think that is one of the huge challenges in modern education. We have put money into child care. We have not really made this a mission for, for education and child development. Some questions from the... Hello. Hello, my name is Simon O'Connor. I'm principal of Jamira College, which is part of the GEMS network here in Dubai. Um, we've heard a lot about the challenges and priorities that are emerging from your work, but I'd be interested to know if you reflect on the, the years that you've been running PISA, where do you see the greatest impact so far, and what are the causes of optimism do you see from the work that you've done? This question over here. Kira Andreas, uh, greetings uh, one physics teacher to another. Um, you talked at the very beginning about having deep conceptual understanding. One of the difficulties we've noticed around the last few days here in the conference is people will not really understand the difference between knowledge, an idea, and a concept, and a concept framework. The, the very much the language that sits underneath that. How do we get across, how do we, how do we get over that hurdle? Because it causes lots of grief. One more. Um, hello, uh, my name is Carrie Sapalo, and I work with the Educational Testing Service from Princeton, New Jersey. And I have a research interest in the area of disability education. And I've been wondering um, how students with disabilities take assessments across the United States. And in this case with OECD, um, do you guys track students with disabilities, both their performance, the types of accommodations they request, and where those accommodations are occurring, and if so, how their performance compares to non-disabled test takers. Mm -hmm. Stop there. Yeah. yeah, on the question of the greatest impact of PISA, it's hard to answer because often it changes over time. In some countries where you could see no impact, the impact has evolved over time. And uh, in, in one way, I'm very optimistic in the sense that kind of the the fact that we can learn from each other is something that is now commonplace. And there's a greater willingness for people to engage with different ideas and different ways of thinking. And, um, but there are some countries which have done a lot. You know, Brazil was the lowest performer in 2000 in the first PISA assessment. It's the most rapid improvers. They have done, made, I mean, that has it, had a lasting impact on the country. They doubled investment in education. In a very short period of time, they basically made this a priority. They invested resources in teachers. My own country, Germany, you didn't come out as well as it wanted in 2000. And it was not the average performance that people were troubled with, but it was the large social disparities. You know, children from disadvantaged background that everybody thought they're in the same school, in the same class, we've taken care of everyone. Suddenly they see actually, you know, social background is a huge driver of success. And they've done something about it. The gap between immigrant and non-immigrant students in Germany, despite growth in immigrant populations, has been closed by half. So I think these are encouraging examples. Japan is interesting. 
you know, they always did well on PISA, but what they were quite troubled with that in the first assessment, they were not doing well on the tasks requiring creative skills. So they put their effort there. They actually had the courage, and that's the hardest thing to do in education. They took 30% of material out of the curriculum. You know, and that's something that you, know, you get the biggest resistance, not from teachers or policy makers, but from parents. Yeah. My child is no longer learning what I learned. The school is dumbing down my child, and all of this kind of thing. They did that, and they saw an increase on creative skills among their children. It's really amazing to see how this was a country with the steepest rise in the capacity of students to solve students creatively. There are many success stories of countries using that well. There are some where very little has happened, some that woke up really late. But overall, I think what we have now is at least a global discourse on education. And that brings me to the question, I think a very, very important one on having a common understanding of core concepts. You know, I don't think we should ever aim at a common curriculum. I don't think that's the point, but we need to be clear about the dimensions of those, that curriculum. We need to be clear about the language that we have. And, and you know, if my background is science, we have a common language. I can talk to physicists all around the world. And in education, we do not have that. We need to create this. And actually, this is one of the greatest contributions I think PISA has made to the field, at least in the, in the, con in the context of curriculum design, that it has defined things like competency like global competency, like knowledge. And I think we are beginning to create the kind of knowledge. With, we, we, you will never communicate if you don't have a common language. And we need to create this. The biggest obstacle there is not just you know, the technicalities. It's often that pedagogical beliefs are often contrary to scientific understanding. You know, one of the things that brain science tells you is you know, the only way you will not learn a foreign language is by teaching you, you know, French or Chinese one hour when you're in secondary school per week. And it's the only way where you can guarantee the outcomes will be zero. Well, what we, do we do? You know, we could teach this in kindergarten, early learning, we would have wonderful outcomes. I, I, and I think that also prevents our collaboration. Our, we, we stand in our own way. We have a mindset that has not adapted to the new knowledge that we have created about our profession. We're not questioning the wisdom of established practice. So, doing better on this, but I do believe that's a contribution where PISA is really, really working on doing this. And then on the question of, uh, of uh, disability, that's something, it's, it's a hard sort of uh, thing to, to, to deal with comparatively because the notion of disability varies hugely across countries. You can see that in the percentages of students that are classified as such, you can see this in the categorization of students. So we look at this from a different way. We basically look at the extent to which students can take the PISA test. Uh, so we, we will not look at you know, how have they been classified in their national categorization, but to what extent are they able to take the test in different forms and adaptations. And actually, when you do good accounting for this, one of the things, for example, that we do is we don't want PISA to become a speeded test where time matters. And if you need an hour more, and you're willing to take more an hour more, we, we give you that hour. We also have, for, for some students, attention span with disabilities is a huge problem. You know, the concentration levels are required are higher. We give you a shorter test. We don't want to make this a time test. Once you do that and you account for those factors, you actually don't see that much of a performance gap. The gap is certainly smaller than the socioeconomic gap that we see in outcomes. So, it's a matter of finding fair way, ways to assess students. And this is not just about adaptations of the test. It's a way of looking at the conditions under which students uh, take that. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Um, I want you to think before you raise your hand about your question and make sure it's really a good question <laughs> because we only have one, one question left and it's something that we're all going to benefit from. And then raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea. There we go. <laughs> and then you expect a good answer. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, Glenn from Canada. Um, just to piggyback on what you said earlier about a common language, I'm wondering if you could just explore that briefly with us, uh, that what you think uh, would be this type of common language. Um, I know John Hattie's written uh, his mm -hmm. wonderful book, and he's got all sorts of uh, common language themes in the back. So I'm wondering if you could just expand on that. What do you mean by a common language, specifically? For example, if we take, about, uh, take the notion of knowledge, of skill, of competency, now we use them often interchangeably. 
and I think what is important is we have a, that we attribute shared meaning on this. When I talk about competence in the way PISA defines this, it has to do with what you know, is you know the knowledge part. It has to be able, it has to do with what you are able to do. Can you apply your knowledge, the skill part? But it also has to do with something. How can you mobilize your cognitive, social, and emotional resources in a given context, in a real-time context? This is very, very central to the concept of competence. It's not an abstract notion. I would be able to do this, but actually, are you able to deploy your resources in real time in this context? That's a definition that we have given to this concept, building on the experience of 80 countries. And uh, once you have that, you can start to discuss, you know, is this the right approach, the wrong approach, can we measure it? But if you do not have that shared notion, and sometimes, you know, even, uh, even concepts in instructional design, uh, when I talk about project-based learning, you know, everybody says, oh yeah, I know project-based learning. People know something very, very different. When you think about professional learning communities in schools, you, know, you go to Singapore, a highly structured environment, you know, classrooms are videotaped, people analyze them, there's a lot of effort to build common understanding about this. In other countries, and I don't put names to this, you have a group of teachers sitting around a table and discussing something. So very, very different kinds of common names, common have used, have so different meanings. And I think what is very important that we become more precise mm -hmm about our educational discourse to be able to address common challenge. So um, before we wrap, you have a captive group here, all who care about education in, in different realms, in different countries. What's one thing that you want us to go home thinking about? Think about the why question. You know, what do we really want to achieve? Why we're here? What is, what is the future for which we want to educate our children? I don't think if, if we have that clear in our mind, if we have an answer to that question, everything else will flow from that. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking him.